Have you heard the phrase, the writing is on the wall, meaning that something is coming that can't be stopped? Well, did you realize that this expression has its roots in the book of Daniel? Welcome to Through the Bible. Our teacher, of course, is Dr. J. Vernon McGee, and today we're in the book of Daniel, chapter 5, at one of the most memorable scenes in the Old Testament. We're at a banquet with the arrogant old King Belshazzar, when out of thin air, the hand of God appears and writes on the wall, and nobody understands the message. So, well, who do they call? Daniel. And once again, Daniel puts his life on the line by doing what he always did. He entrusted his life to God and stood for the truth. You know, Daniel played a unique role for God in his generation, from his youth to old age. He loved God, he obeyed God, and stood for God in spite of the circumstances. And God has his hand on people like Daniel in every generation. You know, whenever Greg Harris and I travel for through the Bible, we see the same thing, don't we, Greg? Yeah, we do, Steve. I think it's the best part of travel. A lot of people hear that we travel to these exotic places and and say, you know, you're very fortunate. And we are, but but the reality is it's the people that we meet. I mean, right. you know, That's... we we did climb in the pyramids, we had the chance and we had fun and it was very hot and and we climbed up inside but really that that had very little to do with what we were there for no. and we took away from that trip the memories of the people uh and and i know you've been touched by some of the people we visited yeah it comes again to mind. I, I think of iad and his faithfulness yeah. in kali katab those of you that listen to the beginning of these broadcasts uh know that Through the Bible has been done in the Arabic language on TV, yes. and uh, Ayad is the, uh, the, is host. the host of the yeah. program. And just knowing and having an opportunity to meet a brother like that um, in that part of the world who is so dedicated to getting the gospel to his people is just such an encouragement. You get so energized by spending time with these men and women who love the Lord, who are put in very dangerous situations, who live in what we would term a third world country mm-hmm. or less with no complaint, yes. and because that is their life, and their heart is for their, their, yes. their lost brothers and sisters in their own country. It's so encouraging. As I've traveled, I've I met people like that. I think of uh, Bat Jargal in, yeah. uh, or we just Mongolia. call him Bat in Mongolia. You've been there. Yeah. I think of Victor in Russia. I yeah. think of Oleg, in Russia. our Russian speaker, who has a severe disability yeah. of his eyes. Oh. He's almost blind. And, and you know, one of the things, Steve, I think we both would agree, we are humbled by their humility, yeah. their love for the Lord. These people are happy to sacrifice. Yeah. Uh, they don't complain about sacrificing for no. the Lord. No, and I think about Simon and Nepal yeah. and the love that he has for his um for the pastors that he works with, for the the small groups that he's starting, for the tremendous distances that he's got to travel, having been with him in the Himalayas and seeing what it's like for him to travel, is just incredible. You got to have some serious endurance to do what he yes, does. Yes, you do. And I think of uh, our friend Tree, who leads yeah. work in Vietnam. Vietnam. And I remember one time I was I was staying in a hotel and and I just we were visiting an office and I saw a a, a, a pillow and a mat on the in the studio. Yeah. And he, and I said, "What's that?" He said, "Well, that's where I sleep, just to save a little bit of money." And, you know, and and same thing with Victor in Russia. Exactly. So what we just want to say to all our listening family is God has his people and he will continue to have them. And we can assure you that that God is connecting us with these amazing, wonderful, humble, dedicated servants. And that's how the whole word is getting to the whole world. If you want to have your passion for the word of God fanned, I would encourage you to join the world prayer team and hear about these stories about these people that we get in contact with on a regular basis. Greg, why don't you pray for us? Heavenly Father, thank you that you're sovereign and you rule over nations and and your purposes will not be thwarted. And we thank you that you have your people all over the world and you give us the privilege of working with wonderful servants of yours. We pray you'll bless them and we pray you'll bless us as we study your word to grow closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. We return today, friends, back here to the fifth chapter Daniel, and we're going to put in at verse 20 here today, and you'll recall that Daniel has been brought into the presence of Belshazzar to interpret that handwriting on the wall, and there it is up there in, I think, real neon lights, and so far nobody's been able to interpret it, and Daniel now, before he interprets it, he gives this young king who is reigning under his father, he gives him the best sermon that probably could be ever given to a young man. 
And now Daniel's not that young man that went in the presence of an old king, Nebuchadnezzar, but now he's an old man that goes in the presence of a young king, and there's no generation gap here either. There wasn't before, and there isn't here. Now will you listen to him, beginning now with verse 20. But when his heart was lifted up, now he's reciting for Belshazzar's benefit of how God had dealt with his father, who actually here is his grandfather, that he had put him on the throne, and he gave him a world kingdom. And then he recites to him the experience he'd had. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him and he was driven from the sons of men and his heart was made like the beasts and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of man and that he appointed over it whomsoever he will. And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this, but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. And they have brought the vessels of his house before thee And thou and thy lords, thy wives, and thy concubines have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. Now, you see, Daniel preaches a very pointed and powerful sermon to Belshazzar before he interprets the handwriting. He informs the king here that God has given the kingdom to Nebuchadnezzar. He reminds him that Nebuchadnezzar had been an absolute sovereign whom no man could question or hinder and whose wishes and whims were the law of the realm. But when he had become filled with pride, God humbled him through a tragic episode. Daniel reminds Belshazzar of his humiliating experience. And you wonder, is Daniel rubbing it in? And I think he is. And he's reminding this young proud king that if he's being lifted up by pride and drink, or if he's being lifted up by pride, it's either being prompted by drink or he's insane. And now will you notice, Belshazzar was proud and vain. Although he knew of his grandfather's insanity, his descent to the level of a beast, Belshazzar had not profited by his experience. Instead, he had committed sacrilege in using the vessels taken from God's temple in Jerusalem. He defied the living and the true God. And by the profane use of that which was holy, he had mocked God and insulted him. Now knowing the truth, he rejected it. God destroys only those who have known the truth and have refused it. You know, during the great tribulation period, those who are deluded are those who will have rejected the light. And Paul makes that clear in 2 Thessalonians, 2 chapter, verse 9. He says, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. They should believe a lie that they might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. In other words, the thing that Daniel is doing is announcing to this man the principle by which God operates, and Paul confirms that. And the Lord Jesus himself made it clear. He says, I'm come in my Father's name. You receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. The crowd in Germany that accepted Hitler is the same crowd that had rejected the word of God in Christ. And believe me, friends, when you turn your back on the truth, You are wide open for any culturism that comes along. Why is it that cultsonisms are growing today and the worship of Satan and all of this talk about demonism? 
Why are we seeing the manifestation? It's being manifested in a nation that has had the word of God and has rejected it. That's the reason we're giving it out. Because I have a feeling, friends, we need to get the word of God out. That's important today. I wish I could lay it upon your heart. We've got enough preaching. We need the teaching of the word of God today. What does God say? We have so many of us, including myself, that tell what I think. Well, what difference does it make what I think? It's what God thinks, and that's the thing that's important. Now, you remember the Lord Jesus said, I've come in my name, you rejected me. If another comes in his name, you'll receive. And this man, Nebuchadnezzar, actually was a picture. He's the first great world ruler. And the last great world ruler, I think, is going to be as insane as the first one. And I, Christ, when he rules, and he'll be an absolute ruler. Now, the very interesting thing, Daniel now concludes this sermon by stating that the handwriting was from the God whom Belshazzar had spurned and ridiculed, and that Belshazzar was a blasphemer. And the question is, had he committed an unpardonable sin? I'll let you answer that. I just know that he had an opportunity here, and he turned it down. Now, I come to a new section here, and he's found wanting, and finished is written over the kingdom of Babylon, and that's the interpretation. Now, here is the writing that was up there, and this is the writing that was written. Mini, Mini, Tikel, you parson. Now, I can't resist the temptation to tell you the little story about the man that he was a foreigner in this country and he didn't understand English too well and he just didn't go to church. But finally his daughter got him to go to church and her name was Minnie. And so finally he went with Minnie to the church and unfortunately the pastor took as his text there that day Meany, meany, tikel you farson. And it's well to always interpret that before you give it out like that, I guess. And this man, he was a foreigner. Nothing wrong with that, of course. All of us were that at the beginning when our ancestors came over here. And so he grabbed Minnie, his daughter, by the hand and took her out and said, let's get out of here. And she, when they got out, said, she said, Father, what in the world is the matter? And he said, with a very heavy accent, didn't you hear what that preacher said? She said, yes. Well, what did he say? Well, he said, many, many come tickle the parson. Well, my friend, that's not the interpretation of this. Mene is translated number, and it's repeated. Number, numbered. And it means the kingdom of Babylon was numbered. God had numbered the Babylonian kingdom. We have an old saying or a common colloquialism, his number is up. That's expressive and accurate. And that's the picture that we have. And you find that actually in the Word of God in Psalm 90, verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. And again, may I say to you, I believe that numbers on God's book, when our number comes up, when you and I are going to finish our earthly career, I think God knows it. You and I don't know it. No one else knows it, but he does know it. There was a young fellow that hadn't flown very much. In fact, he hadn't flown at all. And they were trying to get him to take a trip by plane. And he said he didn't want to take a trip by plane. And they asked him the reason for it. He says, well, I don't want to get on that plane. You don't know what might happen to it. Says it might go down. His friends assured him, says it doesn't make any difference where you are. If your number comes up, why, it's going to come up. It may not come up on the plane at all. If it isn't time for your number to come up, then you can be sure of one thing, you're perfectly safe on the plane. And this boy said, well, I don't worry about that. He says, my number coming up. He says, I just worry about whether it's time for the number of the pilot to come up. And it'd be bad to be on the plane when his number came up. Well, friends, this word here, mene, mene, means number. God had numbered the Babylonian kingdom. And... God keeps track of every moment of every day, and he determines beforehand the length of our days. And friends, I don't think you can change it, to tell the truth. Then, meany, meany, tikel. Tikel means that Babylon had been put on the divine scales. It just simply means weight, and had been found wanting. They just didn't weigh enough. 
They were lightweight. God had raised up Babylon, and now he was going to put it down. Why? Because Babylon had not measured up to God's standard. And we have in two chapters of Revelation about the churches. The Lord Jesus is seen in the midst of the lampstands where the churches are, the seven churches of Asia. He trims the wicks, he pours in the oil, and he snuffs them out when they fail to light. And he judges the church today. Now, we may weigh 16 ounces to the pound on Toledo scales down here, but Christ weighs us on divine scales, and he says to everyone, the church is repent. You have measured up. And he says that to you and me today. You know, our righteousness is not only insufficient, it's filthy rags. Only his righteousness is going to stand the test and weigh out 16 ounces to the pound. We're told in Romans 3.21, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness from God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. It's unto all and upon all them that believe there's no difference. God weighs mankind, you see. He weighs the actions of mankind. Now, peris here means that the kingdom of Babylon was to be divided and given to the Medes and Persians. In other words, the head of gold was being removed, and it was now time for the arms of silver to come into place. God was in supreme command, and God will continue to turn. As the prophet says, God turns and turns and overturns until he comes whose right it is to rule, and he is the one that is coming someday, and until then, God will continue to turn them over and I think he does a pretty good job. I can remember when Mussolini and Hitler and Stalin were a terror and people that were Republicans didn't like the Democrats in office and Democrats didn't like the Republicans in office and all that crowd's gone now. You see, God, he's still in charge, friends. He's the one that's going to turn and keep turning until he comes whose right it is to rule. And Christ is that stone cut out without hands who's going to establish his kingdom down here. Now in verse 29, and I read here, Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet, put a chain of gold about his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler of the kingdom. Notice that, third ruler. How accurate the book of Daniel is. You see, this man's father, Nabonidus, was really the king. And this boy, Belshazzar, was a grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, and his father was out in the campaign, and Belshazzar was the second ruler. And this is what happened, and history confirms this, friends. Verse 30 and 31 now, in that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain, and Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. At the very time this banquet was being held, the Medes were marching underneath the walls of Babylon where the rivers of the canal had flowed. You see, underneath the wall of that city, the canal flowed through the city, made it, by the way, a very beautiful city. But now the waters have been cut off and channeled back into the main stream of the Euphrates River, and this man, Gabrias, is marching his army. And there's the inner city where the palace was. And history says that he was actually, Gabrias and his men were on the inside of the inner city before the guards even detected that anything was wrong. Uh, Xenophon, the Greek historian, records for secular history the count of the way in which the Persians took the city. Belshazzar was slain. He'd been weighed and found warning. And God does that, and he makes no opinion. I don't care what you think and what I think. It's what God thinks. And they use his scales. They don't use mine, and they don't use your standard either. They use God's. God says he was found warning. God says you and I are found warning. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. You and I are just not all wool and a yard wide. We're not warranted to wrinkle and unravel and run down at the heel. You and I, my friend, just don't measure up to God's standard. And we are not on trial today. We're lost. God's offering us salvation. 
Now, this man turned it down, and Belshazzar was slain. And Darius the Median was now the ruler of the kingdom of silver. And he came with a sudden attack to destroy Babylon. And we have that given prophetically in the 21st chapter of Isaiah. And some time ago, I asked how many people had ever heard a sermon on Isaiah 21. I think it was about one to a hundred at that time said they'd heard a sermon on Isaiah 21. Now, I'm not asking for it, but I'm of the opinion that you've not only heard one sermon on Daniel 5, but you've heard many sermons. Now, we find here the statement that is made in Isaiah 21, 5. Prepare the table, watch in the watchtower, eat, drink, arise, ye princes, and anoint the shield. God was overruling. And in a future date, another Babylon will fall by the hand of God. And you have that given to us in the 18th chapter of Revelation. I'm not going to turn to that. Thus ends man's vaunted civilization. Now that brings us to chapter 6. And chapter 6 is probably the most familiar chapter in the Bible. And it's Daniel in the lion's den. And this is the one that you hear so much about. And very frankly, friends, had you ever stopped to think of it, that Daniel only spent one night in the lion's den? He spent a lifetime from a boy of 17 till he's about 90 in the palace of the king, and it was more dangerous to live in that palace as this man Daniel did than it was to spend a night in the lion's den, actually, those lions down there couldn't touch him. But yonder in the palace, he was in constant danger. And yet we like to talk about Daniel in the lion's den. I'd like to talk about Daniel in the palace of Nebuchadnezzar and then of Nabonidus and then of Belshazzar and then of Darius the Medium and then of Cyrus, the great ruler. He was in constant danger because those men were pagan men, and he had the privilege of leading some of them to the Lord. So actually, he only spent one night in a lion's den. Well, we're going to look at it because it has a message for us today. Now, will you notice chapter 6 is the decree of Darius, the Median. Now, we've moved up a long way. You see, we move from Nebuchadnezzar to Belshazzar. Now, from Belshazzar, we move out of the Babylonian kingdom now to the media Persian Empire, to enforce the worship of himself. These rulers are always very modest. They wanted to be worshipped. And Daniel is cast into the lion's den for praying to the God of heaven. Now, I would like to give you just something now by way of introduction to get us ready for next time. And as we've indicated, that this is the most familiar chapter in the book of Daniel. And he spent one night in his long life in the lion's den. Now, the chapter concludes this strictly historical section of the book of Daniel. And the episode in Daniel's life, which it records, is another illustration of the keeping power of God. And it's another adumbration of the way in which God will protect the remnant during the great tribulation period. This is a counterpart of chapter 3, where God preserved the three friends of Daniel in the fiery furnace. Here, God protects Daniel. Now, if there's a question as to the whereabouts of Daniel in chapter 3, there is a question now as to the whereabouts of the three Hebrew children in this chapter. Surely they would have followed Daniel. Perhaps since there's a lapse of time here, they're no longer living. Chapters 3 and 5, give two aspects of the preservation of the remnant, both of Israel and of the Gentiles in the great tribulation period. That makes this very important. And by the way, it has a message for us today because we're told be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And you know, I live in a lion's cage and that lion's cage I live in is this world. And there's a big roaring lion going up and down the cage that I'm in today, and you're in it. And nobody's given us any medal for it, are they? But that's where we are today. Well, we 
just put on that as an introduction. And next time, we'll get started in the text of chapter 6. So until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. What a good reminder. Every day, whether we're aware of it or not, we're involved in spiritual warfare. And our best defense is walking in faith and obedience, keeping our eyes on Jesus. Study more about spiritual warfare in Dr. McGee's booklet, How to Stand Against Satan. Just download a free copy from the resources section at ttb.org. Or if you need help finding a message by Dr. McGee to answer your questions, please call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Tomorrow we travel through another familiar and favorite passage nicknamed Daniel in the Lion's Den. I'm Steve Schwetz, inviting you to come and see it with new eyes here on Through the Bible. To be my own, sin had left a crimson stain. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.